It's great to be back at PCAC, and um, the years, uh, 12 years, I used to not have to wear glasses when I was preaching, uh, and I have to do it again, and the reason I say again is because uh, over the years, uh, I didn't have to wear glasses for many, many years. Prior to uh, being a pastor, I had to wear very thick glasses, and then God was very good and allowed me to have some surgery, which uh, some of you now call LASIK, but back when I was having the surgery, it was just uh, a doctor and a very special tool, scalpel kind of thing, and so it was interesting to to have that done years ago, Um, and God was good, like I said, and it didn't cost as much as it costs now to fix your eyes, but um, we're definitely glad to be back, Pastor Brian. Nellie uh, have done a great job, and uh, I remember, <laughs> appreciate, uh, and you deserve that, by the way, both of you. <laughs> God's been good to have you here uh, almost the whole time. I think, what is it, 10 years? Eight? Okay, a little less. Um, that's what happens when you get older. You just start expanding. Um, this morning, as we begin, um, my wife, Retha, is here, and she's holding our grandbaby, um, but uh, she has traveled to Oklahoma City on train from Fort Worth. We live down in Arlington, and the train station in Fort Worth is a lot closer than the train station uh, over here in Dallas, but uh, I don't know how many of you know that the train between uh, Dallas-Fort Worth, at least from Fort Worth, uh, runs, be- if you get it in a week ahead, a lot of times it's just $25 for going up and then $25 coming back, which is very reasonable considering you're spending uh, three, three and a half hours on that train. Um, so anyways, one day she was going to Oklahoma City to visit our other daughter, and um, there were lots of people waiting for the train. It was a very full train. It was going to be, you know, and they were all lined up there on the platform. Um, how many of you have ever ridden the trains here, you know, Amtrak, I, the, tr- the trains? Anyways, you know that sometimes not all the doors open. Have you ever seen that happen? Um, anyways, the train pulls in, all four cars, um, and of course it's a two-level train, so... Uh, You know, everybody should fit, not a problem there. The bell rings, and the doors stay closed. Three cars, which were all there at the platform, and then, of course, there's the engine and a car right behind the engine. And, you know, people are standing there, and, you know, it's not going to stay there forever, but they're waiting and everybody's crowded around the doors that they see right in front of them on those cars. And the doors don't open. And, you know, this is where most of the people were, was over here, and then the engine's way up here, and there's one car right behind the engine. But nobody was up all the way on that end, because that's the furthest... The station is actually over here, and everybody came out of the station. It's a little cold, so they're right here by the first couple doors and first cars. So I watch Retha, and she's standing about the middle because she'd gotten out of the car and just walked straight across. They'd come out of the station, and all of a sudden, notice that there's one door open all the way at the front of the train, where nobody is. Everybody's back here. The train stops for maybe three, four minutes, and nobody's getting on the train. And so Retha's looking back, and I go, you know, I I can't yell. She's never going to hear me. But I point, and there's about three other people that are standing with her, and they all begin to walk up, and they get on the train because they found the open door. Everybody else is still standing there, just kind of waiting for those doors to open. And then the conductor opens up the window in the middle of the train, in the, like the second car, and says, all aboard! 
and there's no doors open. <laughs> and finally, they figure out that there is one door and a whole train load of cars that is open all the way at the front. So everybody sprints with their suitcases and everything else to the one door that's open. Um, why didn't they look for the open door? You see, there was a door right in front of them, but it's closed. And what I would suggest to you is that many times we get stuck at a closed door and we stop looking for the open doors. And uh, so, you know, the doors to the sanctuary right now are closed. Um, And we don't know what's beyond them right now. There could be treasure beyond that door, but because it's closed, we don't know. And the, the reality is, unless, you know, as the service ends, the doors will open and we can go rushing out. But what if only one set of doors opened? So, I want to talk about open doors as far as the church is concerned today. And we're going to turn to Scripture, which is Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse 7. And I believe you do have the Scripture for the screen so that we can read together. If you've got your Bible or your tablet, um, it may be just Scripture that you've got in another slide, I don't know. Um, But it's Revelation chapter 3, and we're going to start reading in verse 7. And um, a lot of people wonder why this preacher uses a tablet. Me hace más difícil cuando solo tengo una Biblia y necesito hablar en español. Entonces, llevo esta que tiene muchas versiones. Um, If you know Spanish, I was just explaining to you why I use a tablet for my Bible. Uh, Instead of carrying two or three different Bibles, uh, Spanish is my first language, and uh, so I use my Spanish Bible and I use my English Bible frequently, and I discovered that carrying this little thing is a lot easier than carrying two heavy books, and it is God's Word after all. So... um, I'm going to ask you just to quickly stand as we read God's Word together. Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you because you have kept my word about patient endurance. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray. Father, this is your word. We pray that your Holy Spirit would help us to understand it and apply it in our lives. Your Holy Spirit has the power to break chains, to break hard hearts, to change us and transform us by this word, and we pray that it would do so today, that your Holy Spirit He who calls out to us and convicts us of sin and judgment would work freely. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. So, open doors. This church in Philadelphia, which is the, you know, 
Anybody know what the, the, the word Philadelphia comes from? Anybody? What that means? The city of brotherly love. The city of brotherly love. Why? Because the word philos is love that goes between people. Love that is brother to brother. I, I have phileos for Brian. It's a brotherly love. And so we have the city of Philadelphia. And when we are talking about this church, the Apostle John is writing from the perspective of Jesus Christ. I know your works. I've set before you an open door. And then further on, he says, I have loved you. What happens when a church in Philadelphia or in Plano, Texas, loves God the way that they're supposed to, if they obey the great commandment? In Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 and 39, we're given the great commandment. Does anybody know the great commandment? You shall, I can't hear you. Love the Lord your God with what? All your heart, with all your strength, with all your mind. You shall love the Lord your God, number one. And when you love God with all your heart and with all your strength, more, much more than phileo kind of love, this is agape love. When I love God with all my heart and all my strength and all my mind, then what happens? What's the second part of that commandment? I will love my neighbor. That's powerful. And so, here is what does it mean to love God with all my heart, soul, and mind? And I would ask you, what's worship if it's not that? When you worship God in truth, you're worshiping Him with love. So, what does it mean to know God if not to love God? If you know somebody really, really well, you love them. And knowing God is loving God. So, then what does it mean to know someone else, to love your neighbor? It means to know them. And all this process here, the church of Philadelphia, brotherly love, in contrast to all the other churches, if you read through those passages of Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3, all those other churches are getting judgment. They're getting judged because they're not doing what God wants them to do. And so he says, I know your works. What were their works? They were loving God and loving their neighbor as they should. I know that you have but little power. You see, loving doesn't necessarily mean you're powerful, but it does mean you make choices and you make decisions. And then it says, you have kept my word and have not denied my name. They loved God so much that it didn't matter that a Roman emperor said, don't worship Jesus. Don't worship God. You're God. You need to worship me. They said, no, we're going to con continue to worship Jesus. See, they love God that much. Didn't make them powerful in man's eyes, but in God's eyes, they were doing what they should. And they were patiently enduring the trials. You know, the interesting thing about this church all the other churches disappeared pretty quickly in those first centuries after Jesus was born and lived, died, and was raised from the dead. All those other churches disappeared rather quickly. I mean, sure, they lasted a couple, a couple centuries, but do you realize that this church, of all the seven churches mentioned in Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3, this one lasted 1,200 years 
As a district superintendent, one of the things that amazes me is why some churches flourish and thrive and then other churches close. Now, we're not talking about the church of Jesus Christ, which has continued to flourish and grow across the centuries, but individual congregations. This was a congregation, a single congregation, the church at Philadelphia. For 1,200 years, it existed as a single congregation. It was thriving. It was working. God was blessing it. The other churches disappeared. Why? I believe it's, the clue is right here in this passage. They loved God, and they loved their neighbors. They loved God, and they loved their neighbors. How long has PCAC existed as a church? Anybody here know? Church history, folks. <laughs> How long has this church existed? When did it start? Nobody knows? 89? Okay. Probably pretty close to that. It started in a home as a Bible study and then became a, a, a small congregation. When we came in 2006, it was beginning to really grow as a congregation. Um, they'd been about 100 for years, and all of a sudden, boom, it just grew. And, and today it's continuing to grow. You're having baptisms. People are getting saved. Wonderful. But I want you to imagine 89 to now is what? A little bit more than... 30 years? Huh. How about 1,200 years? What would enable, if Jesus doesn't come back in 50 years, will this church still be here or will it be gone? Will this church thrive 10 years from now? I've seen churches go literally from hundreds to nothing in months. This Christmas season, you need to realize that being a church is more than just coming together on Sundays to sing, to hear a message. It's got to be much more than that. And I believe God is placing before this congregation a door, an open door. You're having budget meeting and a lot of people say oh it's just numbers and really it doesn't matter I would say to you that these are the kinds of open doors that could quickly become closed doors because if God shuts the door according to his word we can't open it no matter how hard we pound on it no matter how hard we try and God will close a door of a church. As district superintendent, I've seen it happen. And no matter what I did, no matter what a new pastor did, it just didn't happen. But when God opens a door, we need to take advantage of it. And we need to find those open doors. This church at Philadelphia, actually in comparison to the other churches, wasn't the biggest. In fact, God recognized it and said, you're, you're a pretty small church. Yeah. In the scope of things, PCAC in comparison to some of the other congregations in this large community, this larger city of DFW, eh, it's not that big. <laughs> but if God is working through you and for you, that's not going to matter. It wasn't the most famous church. I would say the Corinthian church was probably more famous, or the Ephesian church was more famous, or the Roman church was more famous. The church of Philadelphia, you don't hear about that in history too much. And yet God says, before you, I'm placing an open door, and they stay open for 1,200 years. 
So what does it mean, he who opens and he who shuts? Well, here's what I believe is an open door. When God's favor is upon you, when God's favor is upon this church, that's an open door. And it won't matter who or what tries to close that door, it ain't going to happen. As they would say, it ain't going to happen. But if God shuts the door, it's not going to be opened. Let's go through some of the slides here. I know there's slides up there and I'm, I haven't done the telling. Go ahead and change that. Look back and thank God. Look forward and thank God. Look back. This church has had open doors. There were doors that were opened that the congregation at that time found and walked through. Believing God wanted to plant PCAC. That was an open door. And they took the risks, those faith-filled risks, and walked through those open doors. And so you're here today because somebody back there Walk through God's open doors. Look back and thank God. Look forward and thank God for the open doors that are going to be appearing. And they're going to appear maybe, and they're, it's going to look maybe perhaps a little risky. Risk is something that we don't like. But if it's of God, then walk through it. If it's of God, then walk through it. Let's go ahead. Next slide who opens doors and no one will shut. Keep going. Who shuts doors and no one opens. Keep going. Go ahead to the next slide. What happens when we obey the great commandment? There's the scripture passage. You can look it up later. But what does it mean to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind? What is worship? What does it mean to love your neighbor as yourself? What does it mean? It may mean making sacrifices and doing things, opening the doors of the church, opening your homes, going out when it's cold to help the homeless. It may mean doing things that make you feel uncomfortable. What God does for the church that lives by his love, laws of love. And that's the point today. Go ahead and go to the next point. So what does it mean, he who shuts and opens doors? God's favor, that first part. Here's some scripture passages I'm just going to read for you very quickly. I'll I'll tell you where they're getting them from. Luke chapter 11, verses 9 and 10. You can write this down. Look it up later because we're going to go very quickly through these. There's so many of them. Here's God's gracious favor. So I say to you, keep asking and it will be given to you. Keep searching and you will find. Keep knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who searches finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. God opens the doors of spiritual opportunities and gifts as we pray for them. Have you been praying for this church that God would open doors and new opportunities? It says, ask, and you'll receive. Search, and you're going to find. Knock, sometimes the door isn't open. And you knock, and you have to knock again. And when you go, and God, is this the right door? And he he doesn't give you another open door. He's saying, just keep knocking. Persist. And then he opens it. He wants to see if we're really going to stick to it. But those spiritual opportunities are going to happen as we ask, search, and knock. Here's another open door to faith. Acts chapter 14, verses 26 to 28. An open door to faith. From there they sailed back to Antioch where they had been entrusted to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. After they arrived and gathered the church together, they reported everything God had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. Think of those people that you're thinking of, man, they're never going to receive Christ. We'll never see them at church. They're so hard. They're so, it's impossible. 
God may give you an open door to their lives where they all of a sudden end up having faith in God and faith in Christ and accept Him as Savior. You see, here's what Paul wrote, or Luke wrote. From there they sailed back to Antioch and they shared with them that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. An open door of faith. It's been amazing to me sometimes when God just seems to open doors of faith to people and communities that seem so closed. Most of you have heard about what happened with Hurricane Harvey down in Houston, right? A little bit of a flooding happened down there. Um, not a good time last year at this time. They were still heavy into recovery. Interestingly, just today, a year ago, the new pastor came to the Greenhouse Community Church. It's an alliance church. Jeff Wheeland is the guy's name. He was the new pastor. He's been there now for a year, exactly, as of today. That church, for over 10 years prior to Jeff coming, had not seen one adult come to faith in Jesus Christ. It had gone from an attendance of over 100 to an attendance regularly of just 50 people. The Greenhouse Church had declined. They had built a new building, and no more people came. They had spent $7 million between property and building, and their attendance actually decreased. So, obviously, building a new building didn't bring more people in. So, Jeff arrived at the beginning of December 2017. And what can we say has happened? Well, there's been 30 adults who've given their hearts to Christ this year in that church. They've baptized 22 people who are all adults. And attendance is 120 now, average attendance on Sundays. So I'm here to report that God opened a door of faith to that community that had been so decimated by the floods. And all of a sudden, people are coming to know Christ. Adults, people who live right around the church, had been, you know, the door, doors of that church had been open, but they hadn't walked through them. But God opened a door of faith. And now he's seeing if you add it up, it's almost one profession of faith per week. Incredible. Remember, this is 10 years they had not seen one adult profession of faith, and now 30 in one year. My guess is that before the end of the month, there'll be another two or three people that come to know Jesus Christ. God can open doors of faith. 1 Corinthians 16, 8 gives another great door. It says, and the Apostle Paul is writing this letter, but I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost because a wide door for effective ministry is open for me. Yet many oppose me. A great door to effective ministry. 1 Corinthians 16, 8. Jeff tells me there is, God has opened a great door of effective ministry for him. And when I look around, I see other churches in the Houston area, Alliance churches, they're not seeing the same results. The church at Baytown, they got flooded. The church at Pearland. And so I'm going, wow, what, what's going on? Well, God's opened a door of effective ministry for that church and for that pastor at this time. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 the Apostle Paul, again writing, when I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, the Lord opened a door for me. If God opens the door, things will happen. 
If God shuts the door, it doesn't matter what you do, it's not going to happen. And the Apostle Paul says, I came to Troas to preach the gospel. He came with intent, but he recognized that if God didn't open the door, all that preaching was not going to bring results. You see, it's not how well we preach, how well I speak. I can speak with golden words, but, but if God's not in it, if God's not opening the door, it won't matter. The Lord opened a door for me, and it says he had results. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 3, at the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door to us for the message, to speak the mystery of the Messiah for which I am in, in prison, so that I may reveal it as I am required to speak. Now, think about where Paul was writing this from. He's in prison. What door would you ask to, that God would open when you're in prison? If you're in jail for preaching the gospel, what door would you pray for? Let me out of here! Paul doesn't pray for that. He says, may the Lord open a door for the message. You see, Paul was more concerned about the message than he was about, and its freedom, than he was about himself being free. Do you see how that works in our lives? What are we praying for? What doors are we praying for as a church? So that I may reveal it as I'm required to speak. The interesting thing is a lot of people came to see Paul while he was in prison. And he preached. And many people got saved. I know your works. He knows what PCAC has done in the past. Behold, I've set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and not denied my name. Key facts. It's not how much power we have earthly-wise. <laughs> it's what are we doing with God's word? What are we doing with his name? Are we lifting Jesus higher? Because if we don't, he will shut the door. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 5, he tells that church, I'm going to remove your lampstand. I'm going to take you out. I came to this district in 2006, and one of the things that I had to do that year was very, very hard for me. Actually, it was 2007. We had served in the city of McAllen, Texas, in a church that grew from 90 to almost 300. In 2007, um, there were only three people left in the church. I appointed an interim pastor, and he called me up one day and said, um, we've led a Spanish family to Christ. And I said, praise the Lord. And he said, They've come to church, and we're thrilled. New people have come. I mean, think about it. There were only three adults in the church. Now, two more adults plus a couple kids come. They've more than doubled in size in one week with profession of faith. And so I was really excited. I was thinking, okay, maybe God's going to do something here. And then about three weeks later, the pastor called me back and said, Mark, we've got a problem. The treasurer went to these, this new family and said, you need to go find a Spanish-speaking church. And the family left. The treasurer was prejudiced against Spanish-speaking people. Now, I don't know if you've ever visited McAllen, Texas, but about 70% of the population is Hispanic, and probably about 40% speak Spanish, and just about Spanish only. And the pastor was reaching people for Christ. If you're in a community like that, 
to have people who are in leadership who say, go find another church. Do you, do you, do you see what that would do to that congregation? How's God going to react to that kind of attitude? So I gave the pastor permission to put that treasure under discipline. You know, discipline is discipling. My hope would be that that treasure would turn around and recognize the sin. They didn't. They said, that's it, I'm leaving the church. They turned in the, the checkbook and left the church. There's a word in the scriptures that's called Ichabod. (laughs) And it's that closing the door, closing the work that God is doing. God decides, I'm done here. I can't do anything more with this. And that's really what he wrote on that church. And the reason it had gone from 300 down to 3 is because of that kind of attitude, that prejudice that was just there. And you know, if, if I walked in the church, oh, it was... Welcome, DS. Welcome, Pastor Mark. It was just all friendly flowing. But there was a heart there that didn't love God and love their neighbor. Do you see how important love is? (laughs) They weren't following through with that great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. They weren't opening doors, they were shutting doors. And so in Revelation chapter 2, verse 5, God says, if you don't change, I'm going to take your lampstand away. And that's a picture of what he will do to any church that won't go through the open doors that he's giving to them. God's favor is here. Question, will we go through the open doors? Revelation chapter 2, verse 16. That verse says that he will fight against them. Now, now realize, this is a church, and it says, he says, I'm going to fight against you. Why? Because they're not obeying. He's going to fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He'll use his word against them. Think about that. In chapter 2, verses 22 and 23, he says he's going to allow them to suffer intensely. And you know, I have to think back to the book of Acts. Um, There were a bunch of believers who were doing amazing things. It says that they were donating properties and and giving funds to expand the church and its ministry in Acts chapter 5. The church was just doing awesome things, and they were seeing open doors all over the place. And in one of those moments, there's, there's a man and his wife who decide, well, we're going to give something to the church, but how they do it is, well, they come and say, here's the whole amount. Not true. It was only part. And God gave a lesson to the church very early in its existence. You don't mess with God. Don't mess with God. If he gives you an open door and you don't walk through it, he will shut it and he will not reopen it. I've seen it happen too many times. and So Ananias and Sapphira were dead. I mean, that's a pretty harsh judgment, don't you think? But you see, they lied not to just the church, they lied to God. And God doesn't go for that very well. (laughs) In Revelation chapter 3, verse 3, he says that he will come like a thief. That he will come like a thief in the night. God's judgment. When there's closed doors to opportunities, he's not going to reopen them. He will close them. And I've seen that happen. And so I'm here, kind of last message you, you said, a challenge. Well, here it is, folks. 
open doors. There are open doors in this community. And if you know and obey God's word, you will look for those doors and find those doors. Like Retha found the open door on the train, and you're not going to just be standing there waiting and waiting and waiting and realizing God's closed the door like they did in McAllen. That was the saddest day probably of my ministry was to close the church that I had worked in. Because of sin. Open doors. Plano, Texas. It's just a, just a small community, right? What's Plano, Texas? In the scope of things. What, what do you see in Plano, Texas? Just a, you know, about 50 people, that's all, right? Is that all that lives in Plano, Texas? How do, how do, the, how do the Dallas Morning Star and the, uh, how, how does that report Plano, Texas? What do you see when you open up the paper and what's it say about Plano, Texas? Somebody in the back going, it's, it's one of the fastest growing communities in the whole United States. It's growing like crazy. People are moving here from all over the country and from outside of the country. This congregation exists because a lot of Chinese people came and started living here and there's all kinds of people moving here. Do you realize the open doors God is presenting to this church to do ministry? I'm not talking about, yeah, there's other churches and they've got open doors too, but this church, how many people do you know that have moved into the neighborhood recently? in your neighborhood? How many people at work, at school? I assume you guys had the fall thing you do with uh, all the new students. You did that this year? You didn't do it this year, but you have in the past. Why? You, because you did. No, no, no. Why did you do, why did you have a thing for new students? Because there were a whole bunch of new students. Now, obviously, there's opportunities all around you. Are you asking God, how can we love them? How can we show them that we love God with all our heart, strength, mind, soul? God is always at work around you. Find the open door. There's a value that is core value for the Christian Missionary Alliance has been a core value of my life. It's this, lost people matter to God and he wants them found. There's a lot of lost people out there. They don't know God. They don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And the Apostle John said it to this group of people this way. You have not denied my name. They will know that I have loved you, verse 9. God calls us to take faith-filled risks. It, it's risky to be a church in this day and age. It's risky to be a Christian in this day and age. It's risky to stand up and say, I love Jesus Christ, and he's my Savior, and he's my Lord, and I'm going to follow his word. It's risky. So there's a children's ministry, Awana. Is that going on? Yep. Hmm. Do you realize that children, it's easier to reach children for Christ than it is an adult? A lot easier. Most people who come to have faith in Jesus Christ come as either a child or a young person, not as an adult. Very few 70-year-olds give their hearts to Christ. It's a lot easier with kids, and you have the opportunity. These kids come, and I, I'm imagining that they're kids that come that have no relationship to the church in and of itself, other than that ministry. They come because the parents say, hmm, somebody will babysit my kids for a couple hours so I can go to Starbucks and have a coffee by myself. <laughs> a 
in talking to Pastor Albert, one of the things that his vision is, is to plant a daughter church out of this church. To plant a daughter church out of this church. An open door. Missions. Uh, You've done Envision, and this church is doing other missions. I saw that you're having a missions conference down in Houston. Um, Is it next week or a couple weeks? Two weeks? Yeah. Opportunities. Open doors. No, we don't have a budget for the children next year. No, eh, you know, missions, yeah, we've got we've to make sure we, we keep the heat on in the building. Open doors, closed doors. Would it be better to turn the heat down a little bit <laughs> during the winter so that you can send one more person to missions? Uh, just an idea. I'm not trying to tell. But do you see, there are open doors. It's, the issue is, are we taking advantage of them? Are we doing what God's called us to? So I've got one more picture to show you. One more picture. Let's keep, yep. I think that should pop if you click it again. Nope, okay, it didn't. Reith and I had the privilege last year of going to Spain. And it's amazing country. One of the things that stands out, though, is that over and over again, we saw these massive churches with closed doors. They're museums at the most. they, They don't open their doors. They're closed. I mean, huge churches, bigger than this church, and all the doors are closed. And so, we took pictures of closed doors, literally. We would take a picture, and it's closed door, and I would stand there, and, you know. So we have all these pictures of Retha or I standing in front of closed doors. That country needs the gospel of Christ. You see, open doors are for a generation usually. So when I say that the Church of Philadelphia went for 1,200 years, it means that there were many generations who opened the door for God to work. Those other churches, Ephesus, Thyatira, Sardis, all those other churches, at some point, who knows whether it was just even a generation, they closed the door. Said, God, we, we just, we don't have enough money. God, we don't have enough people. God, we don't. And God would say, close the door and then they couldn't open it no matter what. So, there's open doors that are available to this church, and I would challenge you to look at the open door. Pastor Brian, we're going to pray. Would you please stand? We're going to pray. Father, there's so many open doors available to us, and I I can't even begin to fathom all the possibilities through those open doors, but I know that you're calling us to those open doors, and I pray, Father, that you would open the door for this church to do your work powerfully here, because you're opening the door, and your gracious favor is on this church and its leadership in the days ahead. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.